Welcome to the Journey Beach Park Podcast, where we make it easy for you to find and experience God. Good morning, church. That's much better. I was going to say, I was like, I heard a lot more young people, they're like, good morning. Okay, all right. Uh, listen, this, this entire month we've been, uh, we've been on the sermon series and topic of miracles, and we've heard, yeah, come on, it's been amazing, right? And, and we've been able to learn uh, how to pray. We've been learning how to search the Lord. And today, I have some very special people that are going to come up and share a little bit of their own testimony about God's miracles in their lives. Um, I mean, I I'll just let them do all the talking because I do enough talking. So without further ado, uh, I want to have our first speaker. Her name is Ari Bonds. Come on, Ari Bonds. Apparently, Ari has a security entourage. <laughs> Good morning, church. Good morning. <laughs> Some of you may already know me, but for those who don't, my name is Arian, but I'm known as Ari. <laughs> um, this morning I will be giving my testimony and what I mean by my testimony I will be walking through moments of my life and how God showed up however church I do just want to get out, give out a trigger warning I will not be offended if anyone decides to leave this room As a little girl, I loved going to church. And when I say loved, I mean loved. I was so involved in my church, I even joined the praise dance team. Every Sunday, I was up and ready to go. Younger me was more than happy. Not because I was going somewhere, but because I was going somewhere I loved to be. Now as a kid, I didn't have the perfect childhood, nor did I have the same experience as other children had. I faced so many things. But what carried the most weight for me was being a victim of rape from the age of eight till I was 12 years old. Looking back, I remember being so disgusted with myself. I wasn't a normal kid who was happy. I was a kid who became very defensive to everyone, a kid with a terrible attitude, a kid with a smart mouth, and a kid who wanted to fight all the time. I wasn't aware who I was becoming at the time also, but my mother had custody of me and my brothers. So the court decided to give my biological father visits every weekend. The visitation started off smooth up until one night. Me and my brother were sleeping. He took me off the bed and he woke me up. He then proceeded to pull out his phone and forced me to watch inappropriate videos with him. He then said, this is what I'm going to do to you. He took me downstairs and as much as it hurt for me to say this, I was raped by my own biological father. All that night I stayed up questioning God, why? Why me, God? What did I do to deserve this? I know that we aren't supposed to question God, but I wanted answers. From eight to 12, every weekend the same thing happened and it only got worse. I lived my life in fear. I lived my life being told that if you ever tell anyone what happened, I'll kill you. Isaiah 41.10 says, don't be afraid, for I am with you. Don't be discouraged, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will hold you up on my victorious right hand. If I would have known this verse back then, I would have opened up right away about what had happened to me. At the age of 15, reality hit me. More difficult things start to happen. I started to fade away from God. I went from being evicted twice, leaving me to be homeless and having no choice but to go from hotel to hotel. At that point in my life, I felt like I was alone. I felt lost. 
It was a battle between myself and the fight against my mind. At that moment, I thought there was nothing God could do. I had severe anxiety and depression. I remember being in a hotel bathroom with a knife around my neck. I wanted to take my life, but I seen a, a light, a bright light, and all I could do was think of Jesus. In scripture it says, Hebrews 13, five, for he himself has said, I will never leave nor forsake you. Even though I felt alone, the light gave me joy and made me realize that I might be going through a storm right now, but he's here walking me through it. Still at the age of 15, I was introduced to a drug called marijuana. At the time, I felt like that was the answer for me. It took away all of my pain, all of the hurt, all of the depression. I finally felt happy. It felt like I could finally live instead of survive. At the age of 16, me and my brother were forced into foster care. I remember me being in a DCFS bathroom crying until I couldn't cry anymore. I looked at myself in the mirror and started praying. I repented. I asked God to have mercy on me. I asked him to perform miracles in me and my brother's life. I told God no matter what happens, make sure that me and my twin brother ended up under the same roof. I was so nervous because I've always heard stories about siblings being split from each other when they fall into the system. But knowing that I had prayed, I was going to walk by faith and not by sight, no matter how ugly the situation was. A day or so later, our caseworker told us that we were, she found us a home and that we were both able to stay in it. I busted out into prayer, thanking God because he showed up and performed a miracle, but not just only for me, for my brother too. A few weeks later, me and my brother got introduced to this church and I grew a quick bond with my youth leader, Eric, and I opened up to him about I was addicted. I told him I was never going to stop smoking. In fact, I even tried to convince him that that was best for me. As I broke into... <laughs> As I broke into the church and relearned the word of God, started praying more, and diving deeper into my faith, I was no longer addicted, okay? When I turned 17, I got baptized yeah. at this church. Also at the age of 17, two beautiful women helped me open up about what had happened to me. My foster mom, Lori Crowell, and another woman, Jessica Clinton. Even though no justice haven't been served yet, I'm still standing here thankful for me being able to even reach this point. Yeah. Moving forward, y'all. I am now 18 years old, still living my life for the Lord, still trying to strive to make changes in my life, still striving to be the better version of myself. I am on my way to graduate from high school. I'm a living proof of a working God. So no matter what storm you're in, I'm here to tell you, please do not give up on God. He has plans to give you hope and a great future. Yes, Thank you. God is good, huh? God is good, huh? Yeah. All right, church, church is dismissed. You guys can go. I'm just kidding. We have. Eliza, we got our next speaker. Eliza, come on, give everybody, give it, Eliza. <laughs> As he comes up to share this. Go ahead, guys. Yeah. Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name's Eli. For some of you know me, I play drums here. Uh, this morning, I wanted to share with you how Jesus lifted me from a dark place and heal my mental health. So, four years ago, my mom and my brother took me to a pier. I didn't know why they would do something so randomly like this. 
We got there and we just sat in silence for a couple of minutes. I didn't know that my mom was going to tell me that my dad passed away unexpectedly. I never thought that this would ever happen to me. So I just sat there and processed what really happened and cried with my mom and brother. I tried to jump in the lake because if my dad wasn't alive, I thought I shouldn't be either. The same feeling of not wanting to be with anyone anymore followed me for a year everywhere I went. The more I tried to hurt myself, the more my mom and family got concerned and decided it would be best if I went to a mental hospital for my behavior. This scared me knowing I wouldn't see them for so long, even though I tried hurting them as well. While in there, I had time to think about how I was hurting myself and other people emotionally. They tried putting me on medications, but they just caused me to have side effects and made it just worse for me. The closer I was to getting out of the hospital, the clearer my answer was. I knew the only medicine I needed was Jesus. All right. I knew he was the only one who could heal me from my pains and my thinking. And a couple of months after I was out, I decided to get baptized and start fresh, pure and surrendered. Yeah. Psalm 40, 1 through 3 says, I waited patiently for the Lord to help me. And he turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the pit of despair, out of the mud and the mire. He set my feet on solid ground and setting me as I walked along. He's giving me a new song to sing, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see what he has done and be amazed. They will put their trust in the Lord. And let me ask you, have you ever been in a pit of despair? For me, it felt like I had so many emotions, but no words. I went to the reach for the top, but my hand just kept slipping. In a vision that Jesus had showed me, I was in a very muddy pit with no shoes. I knew that I did not own the shoes of God's peace. But throughout this journey, God sent me an amazing teacher in my way that encouraged me and helped me. Yeah. Yeah. God, you in your healing in my mind, body, and heart. I know your story might be different. extensive and invasive surgeries in my life. All of them required months of rehabilitation and mobility issues. I had to use a wheelchair, walker, and crutches for years. It all began when I was eight years old. The doctors told my parents I needed back surgery. I now have metal in both of my knees and my lower back. I have donor body parts from four different donors. So technically speaking, you are looking at five different people right now. <laughs> As a side note, if you are ever questioning what happens when you agree to donate, it is people like me that you are helping. I suffer from scoliosis, and my back was curved like an upside down question mark. I was extremely scared when going through such a big surgery. Afterwards, doctors molded and shaped a brace that I would be in for three months and out of school for a year. That was only the beginning. In 2021, I dislocated my leg while showering 
and spent my Easter in the ER. That led to two more separate invasive surgeries on my right knee. They were scheduled six months apart in order for me to heal in between. As soon as I saw hope, and as soon as I started to be myself again, I was laid up in the same way again. The reason the surgeries were so far apart was because I needed to gain strength before the next surgery. All of 2021, I required a walker or a wheelchair, and I felt utterly alone. After that surgery, the doctors told me that I was done, that I could start living my life. In 2023, on Halloween, my left knee gave out, and my body yet again was telling me that I would need help. Once again, I was preparing myself for the worst news, and sure enough, after my parents talked to my surgeon, I would need yet another knee surgery, only on my left side this time. I felt heartbroken, and I felt lied to. I watched my friends grow, socialize, go out, and I yet again couldn't even leave the house. I was immobile. I was back in a brace and using a walker. My faith suffered. I felt alone, tired of the constant pity parties, and I got angry. I wanted to know why I had to go through all this. What have I done to deserve all this? Why is God doing this to me? I was extremely frustrated and I wanted to know why. And I had nobody to blame, so I blamed God. I realize now that that was very selfish of me. And, I could, and God had me go through all those surgeries so that I could share my journey and speak with authority on this topic. My dad's response to that question is something I'm still trying to wrap my head around. He told me that God used me in my handicapped state to bring the best out in others around me. That people would stop and open doors for me. That people would want to be in service to help me. That they would want to be the best versions of themselves around me. That this is my ministry. And even my dad was my student at that moment. Scripture says in Psalms 139, 13 through 14, for you formed my inward parts you wove me in my mother's womb. Come on. I will give thanks to you, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Come on. Wonderful are your works. My soul knows it very well. Amen. I like this verse because even though I've been through storms, this verse reminds me that God made us all perfect in his eyes. And I have a purpose. So, am I a miracle? I am working on that. There is nobody in this room that is more thankful to be walking today than I am. Why has this happened to me? I am still waiting for God to show me the rest of his plan, but I am extremely thankful. Thank you, Church. Shanae Martin. I'm 28 years old, and if you don't know me, that's pretty much all you need to know about. Um, <laughs> another fact you should know about me is um, when I was born, on the way out of my mom's canal, my left shoulder got stuck underneath my mom's pelvic bone. When the doctor ended up snatching me out by my left arm, he ended up completely tearing three nerves out of my spinal cord, leaving my left arm partially paralyzed. So if you see why I'm holding this mic a little bit different, that's exactly why. But God. All right. As a kid, I didn't really feel a need to be like everybody else. I didn't feel a need to have it fixed. Um, that's not something that I really wanted to go through because my mom treated us all the same. We got consequences all the same around the board. I just got the rotisserie whoopings. Like, you know, she's going to hold you up by one hand so you can't run. <laughs> Hey, she didn't play no favors. <laughs> the older I got, 
the when I started going to school, elementary school, middle school, and high school, I began to hear things about my arm and about my appearance that I didn't see in myself when I looked in the mirror. And it made me question myself. So I didn't feel the need to be perfect. I didn't want a healing physically from my arm because it is what it was. And if my family accepted me, that's all that I pretty much needed. But there was a different spiritual healing that I needed in that moment that I didn't know about. In elementary school, I would suffer with depression. I don't have depression because depression can visit, but it cannot reside here. All right. So as a kid, I would suffer with depression. My mom didn't find out until I was in my early 20s that I was suffering with depression. She found a journal that I would write in elementary and middle school describing how I just wanted to leave this earth and take my life. It wasn't until the age of 24 that my sister found out that I was cutting myself. It's not something I'm very vulnerable with and that I'm open with, but I know that there's a testament. There's a testament in my testimony and my testimony is proof to someone else that God does exist. Because when people start to question, how are you here and why are you here? How can you do this when your left arm is partially paralyzed, but God? This is not me, but God. So, as I'm sitting here and being vulnerable and open because that's something that I'm usually not, <laughs> I'm usually not so open and free to tell, I found that there was power in desperation. And there's pot in desperation, there's vulnerability. So I'm going to read you a verse. And my passage is in Mark chapter 10, verse 46 through 52. It said, Then they came to Jericho, and Jesus and his disciples, together with a large crowd, were leaving the city. A blind man was sitting by the roadside begging. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many rebuked him and told him to be quiet. But he shouted all the more, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stopped and said, Call him. It's crazy how God will use the same people that are rebuking you to call you forth to him. Yeah. Jesus said, Call him, as if he didn't know his name or his situation. Come on, So they called the blind man, Cheer up, on your feet, he is calling you. Throwing his cloak aside, he jumped to his feet and came to Jesus. What do you want me to do for you? As if he already didn't know. Jesus asked him. The blind man said, Rabbi, I want to see. Go, said Jesus, your faith has healed you. Immediately he received sight and followed Jesus alongside the road. Whenever the word called is used in the Bible, it's using to give someone a new identity. In that moment, he received a new identity out of his desperation, his vulnerability. Society will tell you that there's a mask that you need to hold. There's a, there's a certain persona, there's a certain image that you need to hold. And all of us in this room at some point in our life has masked. I'm okay. How are you? I'm good. Sometimes that's needs to change to from I'm good to do you have time to listen? God has bestowed a new identity to me, but as I said, it's not that I don't struggle with the spirit of heaviness because that's all that it is. Depression, anxiety, grief, sorrow, the spirit of heaviness. I battle the spirit of heaviness, but it doesn't reside here. I don't have depression, I don't have anxiety. I battle with it. My message and my encouragement to you would be to tell your story and be vulnerable and open. Because what may seem like the perfect package or it may seem like you got it all is not. You but God. <laughs> but God always. But it's not. Take the time out of your day to hear someone's story and be encouraged by their vulnerability and share your story. The reason why it's so easy sometimes just to get up and speak to people is because I know that you have a story of your own. Thank you. My name is Shanae Latrice Martin. I am a child of God, a daughter and a mother, and I am here now as a six year. Cole Peterson, and I don't know what I have to say after that. Um, wow, isn't God good? Um, I'm a little bit, I'm not a little bit, a lot of bit churchy. Um, and so I'm gonna check the room real quick. We used to say things like, uh, God is good. 
and all the time. All right, okay, we went to the same church going on, so I'm, I'm okay, I'm in the right place, okay. I, I just had to make sure, you know, I, I just had to make sure. Um, so I'm gonna start out by saying that I'm still alive. And um, a lot of you guys may not know what that means to me because you see 24 year old me. But 24 years ago, um, I sat in the hospital. Um, when I was born, uh, my parents were on the way to the hospital and they thought it was gonna be a regular birth. And so I come out and um, they were feeding me and they're like, where is this food going? And um, I didn't use the bathroom for two days. And um, so the very thing that they were feeding me that was supposed to be good for me was killing me at the same time because my intestines weren't connected together. Um, and so the food was going into my body instead of my stomach. And so um, for two months, my parents drove back and forth from the hospital, um, not knowing exactly what was gonna happen, but this just proves God's faithfulness. And my parents were there, God was watching over me. Amen. Romans 8, 28 says, and we know that all things work for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose. I wanna let everyone know in this room that nothing can stop what God has called. Another scripture that I have is not going to be on the screen, but Psalms 119.71, I, I begin to appreciate scriptures like this. This passage of scripture says, my suffering was good for me, for it taught me to be patient, and it taught me God's decrees. I think that we need to take a little bit more of a light attitude when we go through things, because we get to see God's character, and he gets to build character inside of us. But in reality, what happens when the damage that happened to you was done by someone who was supposed to take care of you? In 2 Samuel, 2 Samuel the fourth chapter, we're told of a story of a boy named Mephibosheth who was being taken care of by his nurse because his dad and grandfather were on the run because King David is taking over. And in that very moment, his nurse takes him and runs to flee. But as she's doing the best thing that she thought possible, while she's running away, she drops him. And at that moment, at five years old, he's paralyzed. I want to let someone know in this room that your life damage doesn't determine or delay your destiny, but your vision does. Do you see your way, yourself the way God sees you? And a lot of times it's very easy to look at our life and look at the things that we go through. But I want to share a little bit more about that story. In the, in the end of that story, the very thing that they were running away from, they were running away from King David at that time. And the very thing that they were running away from, King David calls his men to go get Mephibosheth from where he's from. He's lame in both feet, remember that. And they carry him to the place where King David is and he's restored to the table, eating at the table with the king. And so the very thing that sometimes we run away from because it's scary is the very thing that God will call us back to and restore us. It's very easy for our minds to go all over when we go through things. Psalms 1, uh, Psalms 8, 4 and 6 says, What is a man that you are mindful of him, yet the son of man that you visit him? And it's very easy to look at our life damage when we go through things and say, God, why me? Why would you choose me? What is the end of this story? But David gives the answer in that it says, For you have made him lower than the angels, and you have crowned him with glory and honor, and you have made him to have dominion over the works of your hands, uh, and you have put him in all things under their feet. I want to let you know that God will never call you to a thing that he can't carry you to. Also, that the damage that you are in was never supposed to be your destination, but it was supposed to be your transportation. The damage that you go through was never meant for it to be a place that you stay in. It was meant to take you to where God has called you to be. And I thought that my testimony was over 24 years ago. A lot of you guys in this room don't know that. My youngest daughter was rushed to the hospital. And how funny God is, she's rushed to the same hospital that I was rushed to when I had emergency surgery. And so a lot of people in that moment would freak out and were frantic, but I was calm. One thing that God spoke to me on the way to the hospital, he spoke to me and said, son, your wounds are credit. And so in that moment, I could have freaked out, but as my baby lay with the oxygen mask on her face, I told God that if my wounds are credit, then I'm cashing in on my baby today. So I was able to pray from a place of victory because I knew that I touched the wounds that I had. And I was able to pray over her in expectancy, knowing that God brought me out so that he could do the same thing for her. And I didn't share this with first service, but 
God took me in a time where uh, I just began to walk the hospital halls and I said, God, I know that these people may be in worse shape, but God, you can bring them out. There is a God that is faithful. There's a God that's Jehovah Rapha. He's a healer. And these people need to see the hope of Jesus. And so I was able to be, I didn't know that uh, my baby would have to be in the hospital for me to go pray for people. But however God th sees things fit, we should be obedient to the way he calls us to do things. Philippians 1 and 6 says, being confident in this and knowing that he who began a good work will carry it out into the completion of Jesus Christ. The last thing that I want to leave you guys with is, if you're still alive, God has still got time. Nothing is wasted in the hands of the master. Come on, give our speakers another, another round of love. Um, you know, I'm so blessed to, to call them friend, to, to know them, every single one of them. Uh, they have a great and amazing story to share, uh, and, and I wouldn't have it any other way. I, I, one thing I noticed in, in hearing their, uh, their testimonies and their stories is there's a, there's a common thread, and that's, that's time. The time that it took from the moment that they realized that they needed a miracle to the time that, that and God came through and answered their prayer. Time. It's a common thing that I, that I noticed. And we're just going to take that thought we'll just put it off to the, to the side for a second. I just want to share with you a passage of scripture. And it says in Psalm chapter 1, it says, Blessed is the one who does not walk in step with the wicked, or stand in the way of sinners, or sit in a company of mockers, but whose delight is in the law of the Lord. And who meditates in his law day and night. That person is like a tree that is planted by, by the rivers and streams of water. The, the Hebrew actually describes the rivers, rivers of water as, as more, more like rushing water. Not just calm stream, but rushing waters. And it says, which yields its fruit in a season and whose leaves does not wither. And whatever they do, prospers. Jeremiah also echoes the same passage in chapter 17, verse 7 and 8, and he says, and I actually like this, this version too, it says, But blessed are those who trust in the Lord, and have made the Lord their confidence and hope. They are like trees planted along a riverbank, again, the rushing water, with roots that reach deep into the water. Such trees are not bothered by the heat. Their leaves stay green, and everything that they do, and they, they will never stop producing fruit. Now, now, I don't know about you, but every time I read this passage, or, or, or either one of the two, I get a certain picture in my mind. I get a nice, beautiful, green, grassy grove with a river running right in the middle. Maybe a, a, a actually, I have a picture of it. I think I have a picture of it. It's a, a mountainous backdrop. This is the picture that I get when I read that passage. And I, and I, I also see the, uh, the deer with antlers in it. Um, and, and I want to shoot it because actually that's really good meat. But by the way, besides the point, some of y'all like it. But that's the picture that I get in my mind. But there's something wrong with this picture. The, 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 the problem with this picture is we got to understand that the Bible wasn't written in English. The Bible wasn't written to uh, Midwestern American Christians. The, the Bible was written for our benefit years after it was established, but the Bible was not really written for us originally. The Bible was written for ancient Hebrew desert people. So when I read this passage, it's wrong for me to think that this is what this passage is looking like because I'm not doing it justice. The truth is, is I have to put my mind in the place of an ancient Hebrew desert person. So when the Bible speaks about this tree that is planted by the rivers of rushing waters, uh, a, a, lot of, a lot of scholars and, and biblical botanists, which a botanist is just a person who, uh, who failed school and then they decided just to study trees, right? Um, just, just kidding. Just kidding. I'm just kidding. But a botanist is a person who studies trees and there's biblical botanists and they, they dedicate their lives to studying the trees and the plants that are mentioned in the Bible. And biblical botanist, as a matter of fact, the, the, the leading biblical botanist, his name is Noga Haruvini, and he said, that the tree that they're talking about in this passage is the acacia tree. And the acacia tree is known by the desert people as, as the gift of the desert. Why? Because this tree in its season bears amazing fruit. When you take this fruit, I think you boil it in water, you can feed it to a camel and a camel is fed for up to a week with just a handful of fruit. 
Um, in its season, this tree is beautiful and bright and green, and as it expands its, its, uh, its, its limbs, it can give shade to a large group of people. I think we have a beautiful green acacia tree picture, just so you can get, this is the acacia tree. Beautiful and green, in its season. But the Bible is describing this tree, and, and why does the Bible describe this tree and compare this tree to us? Now, now, mind you, in its season, this is what it looks like. But in the off-season, in the dry season, I have another picture of what this tree looks like in, in its off-season. This is what this tree looks like in its off-season. And many people might think that this tree looks dead. The truth is, the tree is not dead. Because the, 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 the tree produces fruit in its season. So how can you produce fruit if you're dead? But, but, but the Bible is saying that, that we are like the acacia tree by the rivers of rushing waters. Now, another problem is if we think about it as desert people, how often does it rain in the desert that there's rushing waters running through it? How often? The truth is it rains that much every 10 or 12 years. Every 10 or 12 years, the acacia tree will be in its season because that's when it receives its water. And so when it's not dead, and because it's not dead, then what is it? Well, scientists say that the tree is actually dormant. And it's staying still, waiting for the moment where the rain to come. So let's go back to our original question. Why does the psalmist compare us to this tree? Well, the truth is, is that God is looking for a people who will meditate on his word day and night. And in its season, you will bear the fruit. In your season, you will bear the fruit. Yes. But Eric, every 10 or 12 years, what am I supposed to do? See, the problem is, is we live in a microwave society. We want things to be heated up right now. And what God is desiring is for people to toil. This word toil means a person who will, who will uh, work long and hard. Will you be willing to work long and hard and toil and pray and meditate on his word day and night waiting for your miracle to come? Can I have the, the worship team come up? The problem with our society and the way we think today is, that, is if we want everything to come now, but God is looking for people who will grind through the hard times. Simply being okay with the breath in your lungs. I don't have a, a full bright green leaves my entire life. All I need is the breath in my lungs to push forward. So then we go back to this concept of the time that it takes for us to pray and for us to receive this miracle. If God were to give you your miracle the moment you ask for it, you wouldn't do anything to receive the miracle. You would just say, God, I need it. He gives, he's not your genie. God is a God of truth. He's a God of love. He's a God of justice. And he wants you to want him. You would, if, you, if God gave you your, 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 your dreams and your desires, you will have no dependency in Christ. Right. You will not be digging and find any reason to dig into his word. You will not grow. And so God needs you to remain dormant and meditate and pray. Are you willing to, in your dry season, like Jeremiah says, that the sun won't bother you. You won't be bothered by your off season because you are meditating day and night. Are you willing to toil? I want to invite you all to stand to your feet. God is looking for people who will pray in their dry season. God is looking for people who will toil. God is looking for people who will meditate day and night, waiting for their season to come waiting for that rain to come you will not die you will not die the bible says in isaiah chapter 40 that those who wait on the lord shall renew their strength they will mount up on wings like eagles they will run and not be weary they will walk and not faint the bible says that if you seek me you will find me if you seek me with your whole heart. God is waiting for you to toil and to pray and to meditate. God don't want no baby Christians who just want to sit on a bench and are okay with just wearing a jersey. God wants you to get in the game. And you can't get in the game if you're not willing to put in the work. God's not just going to give you something just because you asked for it. He's not your birthday genie. God wants you to toil and to fight and to pray because that's where you grow. That's where you grow. So as we, we're just going to get into some worship. Because I don't know about any other way to toil and to pray than to give God thanks and give him glory 
God gave you breath. He wants it back. Give him his glory back. Give him his praise back. Give him his praise. Because sometimes all you have, sometimes all you have strength for is to say hallelujah. Sometimes all you have strength for is to give God thanks and to give God glory and to give God praise because you don't have anything else to, re to, to, to offer him. But that's all he wants from you. All he wants is your gratitude. All he wants is your heart. So as we, as we open up our hearts in worship, this altar is open. Calm down. Don't wait. Because your relationship with your wife and your husband and your brother and your sister will not, if that doesn't determine your salvation with Christ. It's your, your relationship with the Lord that will get you through. I have gone through a dry seasons in my life. And I'm in one right now. Since, the, since the, 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 my eighth grade year in, uh, in middle school, all the way through a year after I graduated high school, I was homeless. We lived in hotels. We lived in other people's homes. My parents lived on the south side of Chicago while I lived in Waukegan with some family friends. And, and that situation tore my brothers and sisters apart. And to this day, I got family that lives 10 minutes away from me and I haven't spoken to them in years. I pray all the time, God, re renew that relationship, restore that relationship, mend it, and it still hasn't come through, but God wants me to continue to toil and to pray and to meditate because I'm not dead yet. I'm just dormant. Amen. You are not dead yet. You're just dormant.